Hello, welcome back to the teaching series Acts of Grace. And we finished up last time, didn't we, thinking about Paul going into the desert of Arabia. And we were saying at the time that it was a hugely significant place for Paul to have ended up. I mean, obviously, it was the place where Moses had received his revelation. It was the place where the manna fell. It was the very place where Elijah, in his terrible state of despair, had wandered around to and fro. Uh, and so it was a very useful place for us to think of Paul being getting his own revelation. But also, would you notice that Paul was in this wilderness for three years? Uh, and we need to just, to just to, for a second to think about that, because we have been talking for now for three episodes about this, this, the importance of, this, of, of waiting, the importance of preparation. And today's the last of those, the, the three talks I wanted to do on that. But I, I do want to make sure that we just really get this down and get this understood, because it is so essential. And if we're going to stop burnout and shipwreck within Christian ministry, then this, I think, is something we're going to have to be very honest about. Um, watch this, because Paul is here for three years. Now, you may feel like this is the Apostle Paul, and for all he's gone, for all he knows, you might think to yourself, to take him out of commission for three years is like really expensive, but not at all. Remember, Jesus doesn't do, only does three years of ministry himself. Think about that, for 30 years, Jesus doesn't do any ministry at all. Um, the reason is this, if you spend time with men, you find out what men know. If you find, spend time with God, you find out what God knows. And, and we really need to spend more time in quietness. We need to spend more time in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. More time simply being in Him and being Him in the midst of it all. Um, imagine, what is it, 1100 odd days? Consecutive days, mind you of just quiet time. Imagine that, 1100 days in the presence, 1100 days of stillness, 1100 days of just feasting, soaking, listening, uh, enjoying the presence of God. 1100 days, can you imagine? <laughs> that would be amazing. The 12 spent three and a half years, didn't they? And in that three and a half years, they do very, very little ministry at all. Um, because there's no escaping preparation. There is no escaping it. Uh, the tendency we have today is to push people into service, and I think it's a mistake. Uh, there's a, a very well-regarded book by a very well-regarded person, an author called George Barner, and Barner's book is called The Seven Habits, I think, of highly, or The Habits of Highly Effective Churches, something like that. And one of the things that he identifies in his book um, and I don't know if uh, Barnes moved around on this recently, he may well have done, but this is some time ago I remember reading this. He said that the, the, one of the key, identi the key identifiers of a successful church is they put people into active service at the earliest opportunity. And, and I've seen that all over the Christian world, that they, as soon as somebody shows anything like any promise, they just thrust them into Christian service. And I cannot tell you what a mistake I think that is. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones always used to say, um, that there's nothing worse than a person becoming successful before they're ready. And you know, the truth is that we can press people into active service, we can easily do that, but who benefits about that? Who, who really benefits? Uh, you know, it, it, read all the studies, read everything you like, they'll tell you even studies about uh, job burnout, executive burnout, that there is a kind of burnout zone, a real danger zone, where people burn out in their 20s and 30s. High achievers, real people that are really go-getters, and they are the ones that will absolutely burn themselves out because they just have, simply have no sense of self, no sense of personal identity, and it's all this driven, this driven, this driven, this driven, this driven. And we see that in the church, and I tell you, it's a great sadness when we see it. Um, and the truth is, the evidence of the New Testament seems to be seems to set its face completely against this idea of rushing people into service. Uh, the New Testament knows nothing of it. I've told you in the Book of Acts, you've got these group of people. They, they don't do anything. They don't do anything for eight years. You've got Paul, the greatest apostle that ever lived, who doesn't do anything for three years. You've got the apostles themselves, who don't do anything for three and a half years. They don't. They don't do anything at all because it takes time to learn the deep things of God. And the truth is, God is not looking for men that are empowered outwardly. That's not what God looks for. He's not looking for the outwardly empowered. He's looking for men who are, who are broken and who are inwardly transformed. 
It's an inward life. It's an inner life, not an outer life. It's not a showy life. It's an outer life that really determines those who will make a difference. Uh, in 1 Timothy 3, it says, you know, when you're looking to elders, don't pick a com an early a young convert. Don't do that. Um, even Paul himself, even with all that Paul knew, still had to have the, 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 the need to be reinsured. It said of him, um, I was given, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh to stop me from becoming too elated, if you like, to up myself because of the surpassing revelations that I had. It takes time, it takes time uh, to work the law out of us. To get the law out of our system takes time to flush it out. It takes time to die to self-righteousness. It takes time to die to judgmentalism. It takes time for God to work his character in and through us. Let me tell you, there's no shortage of characters, but it takes time to develop character. That takes time. It takes time to learn the mystery of Christ. You don't learn that in a textbook. You don't learn that in a classroom. You learn that in the wilderness. It's in, the Bible says in Jeremiah, you find grace in the wilderness. It's in the darkness. It's on the desert roads that you discover these things. It took Moses, what, about 40 days to write the law onto the tablets of stone. It takes a lot longer to write those same laws, if you will, on the, ta on the flesh of our heart. It's very, very important. Um, so... Paul says, going back, do you remember our text when we looked at in Galatians? He says, and this is the point, the only way to make him known effectively is to know him personally. That would be my contention. Paul says, when, but when God, who set me apart, remember, from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. That I might preach the gospel of grace. Remember when, he, when was Paul set apart? I mean, in a birth. Uh, uh, now there's two phases, I think, of, of God's dealing with us, and they're important. There's the setting apart phase, and there's this calling phase. Um, there's this period, if you like, of what I would not want to call unconscious preparation. And this is a period, I think, where Paul is talking about God knows the works that he has prepared for us. Um, and so he, he, he now, having prepared the work for us, he must prepare us for the work. So he prepares the works for us, and then he prepares us for the works. And even Paul's checkered, to put it mildly, history in religion, uh, is nonetheless part and parcel of his preparation for the preaching of the gospel of grace. There's no detail that's overlooked in these things. Um, there's no mistakes made as he weaves out his plan. God needed to, 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 to raise a man to shatter legalism, so he takes a legalist and shatters him. That's just the way he does it. Um, Paul says, look, when Paul is writing his own biography, he says, it's we who are the true circumcision. This is in, in Philippians. He says, we who worship by the Spirit of God, he says, we who glory in Jesus and who put no faith, no true confidence in the flesh. He said, if we want to talk about having confidence in the flesh, I myself have reason to have confidence in the flesh. Paul says, let me just tell you something. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I, says Paul, uh, am from the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews, Paul says. <laughs> Watch this for a minute because this is important for us to remember. Paul's saying, I am from the tribe of Benjamin. And this is prophetic. But now you know, don't you, that Rachel had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, you, do you remember the story from Genesis, going back into the early part of Genesis, or late part of Genesis, where she, the mother Rachel, is giving birth to her son, um, Benjamin. And as she, as she does so, she dies. It's in Genesis 35, and it's a, in a dying breath, she cries out, Oh! Uh, Benoni, and she names her son Benoni, and Benoni means son of my troubles, and with that she gives out her last and dies. Jacob, the father, reaches his hand out and says, no, you will not be called Benoni, you will be Benjamin. And Benjamin means the son of my right hand. 
And so I wonder if prophetically somehow that Benjamin is a type of Paul the Apostle. In other words, this much-loved son who is a source of trouble, who, 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 um, who even when he's blessed by his father is described in Genesis 49 as a ravenous wolf, but that he is called at his outset, he's called by his mother, son of my trouble, but in actual fact his name is changed by his father to son of my right hand. It makes me wonder if on the right hand of the father there will be Benjamin in the, fa in the name of Paul the Apostle himself. And I just said that prophetically to you because there are a number of us, there are a number of us that will be watching this video, there are a number of us that we will know, there will be a number of us that live in our communities and church with us and fellowship with us who, who, who are thought of as being Benoni, sons of trouble. But let me say to you prophetically today that you are not Benoni, you are Benjamin. You are the son of my right hand. Look at the trouble of Paul that tore Israel to pieces, uh, tore doors off their hinges and plundered homes and dragged people away in order that they might be killed for the sake of professing Christ. He himself is the apostle of grace. Don't think that it's how you start this thing. <laughs> oh no. Even in, even in that time, even when he was a son of great trouble, he was nonetheless always, always, always prophetically the son of God's right hand. So hold on to that, my dear friends, if you have been thought of as being a Benoni. Because there is a transformation that is taking place in your life that took place in Paul's. Where you move from being a Saul to a Paul. Where you move from being the hunter to the hunted. Where you move from being the persecutor to the persecuted. Where you move from law to grace and from law and grace to life itself. The son of trouble to the son of your right hand. My, my friends, please don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on those that you love because God's not finished. Oh, not by a long, long way, God's not finished. And so Paul knows, Paul sees himself and understands himself as this one of, uh, of preparation. And of course, when we meet him at first, when we first see him, the Paul we encounter is still very much the ravenous wolf, is still very much in the Benoni phase. But he knows, as he's his own testament, he's a Hebrew of Hebrews, and he will stand before the people and say, in regards to the law of Pharisee, in regard to zeal persecuting the church, uh, as for legalistic righteousness, he will say, I was with, beyond the class, I had outclassed everybody of my generation. But then the Lord laid his hand on him. Then the Lord led him into the wilderness. And from when he emerges, and says, whatever was a prophet to me, I now consider to be a loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, whatever, everything I consider loss for the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus. I consider it rubbish. All that I want is that I may be found in him, that I may know him. Not having a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness that comes from Christ Jesus my Lord, his righteousness. Ah, Paul says, as he emerges from that three years of, 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 of soaking in the wilderness, I want to know Christ. Oh, and I want to know the power of the resurrection, and that I might become like him in his death, that I might somehow be like him and attain to the resurrection of his life. Oh, says Paul, that's what I want. How, did he, how was he called, remember? By grace, by grace, by grace. When it pleased God, it says, to call him by grace, he came, he came up. And there he is, and there we are. Why did he call him? In order to, that he might make himself known to him. How did, could he possibly do that? He did that by revealing not Christ simply to him, but by revealing Christ in him. But when God, it, he says, had who set me apart from birth, uh, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, that I might preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow, what a wonderful, wonderful idea. So here is Paul, and we will have to, for a moment, not see him as Paul just yet. We'll still have to meet him and remember him as Saul first before the, as he kick-starts the entire uh, spread of the Christian gospel. 
we will return next week to Acts chapter 7 and we will come face to face with Paul as he meets his, uh, well, his nemesis maybe. Maybe that's what it is. He'll come face to face with, with Stephen. And Stephen is, a, a, is of a different order. Stephen is of a different magnitude. Stephen is of, of a very, very different spirit. And it's going to be exciting to see him. And we'll see the contrast between the two. We'll see what Luke is setting up for us. Because as we do see that, and we see where that takes us in this, what I'll call the clash of the titans, I think you're going to find that quite an interesting, an interesting talk. So, all right, well, we look forward to that, and we look forward to that next time. In the meantime, I wish you a good week. And remember, you are are not Benoni, you are Benjamin, and God bless you because you are the sons and the daughters of God's right hand. Have a lovely week and live in the power of that truth. God bless you. Bye-bye.